Welcome to a Creative Approach Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Poirier Brody. I'm delighted today to have as my guest Mark Montano, who strives to make the world a better place through creativity. He's a designer, TV host, and best selling author. You may have read the Big Ass Craft Book series published by Simon & Schuster, which are the best selling craft books in the USA. I first learned about Mark through his work in television. Some shows you may remember are While You Were Out on TLC and 10 Years Younger on TLC. His current show is Make Your Mark for PBS APT. He's a creative consultant for Deco Art and a creative director for Eclectic Products, makers of E6000. You can see him weekly on YouTube. Mark has also hosted the Crafties Award Show. The Crafties feature some of the finest examples of craft projects. I was lucky enough to attend the San Francisco show and watch the behind-the-scenes work of Mark Montano in action as host. Of course, Mark visits the Association for Creative Industries' Creativation event, as I do. It's always a pleasure to see him there. Mark has a terrific creative approach to life, and I welcome you to our conversation. Well, hello, Mark. Hi. Welcome to a Creative Approach podcast. How are you doing today? I am great, and I'm so excited to be hanging out and chit-chatting with you today. That's wonderful. Well, you know, when it comes to a creative approach, I have to say Mark Montano's at the top of my list. I mean, I've been a great fan ever since I saw you on Trading Spaces. And of course, I have some of your books, those, let's see, it's the Big Ass Book of Crafts is one, right? Mm-hmm. And so right now, you, I watch a lot of your Facebook Live videos, and can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing as far as Facebook Live and some of your other projects? Wow, I'm doing a lot. <laughs> so as you Good. know, I've partnered with several companies. Deco Art and E6000, who I've been working with for years and years. And what I do is create content to promote their new product launches. I work as a creative consultant for both companies. I help them with their marketing, and it sort of fits into what I do. I've written 11 DIY books at this point. The Big Ass Book of Crafts was sort of my first big seller. And then I did a line of big ass books after that big ass book of home decor, the big ass book of bling and the big ass book of crafts volume two. So it all just kind of funnels into what I do every day, which is create content and utilize these brands, which I love. They're terrific brands. They are <laughs> great quality. They're innovative. They come up with new things all the time. So I'm constantly being creatively challenged to come up with new projects and new ways to use their products. It's a dream life if you're a creative person. <laughs> well, it's wonderful. And the projects are not so complicated. I mean, they're lovely. I know I've done a couple of them. Uh, there was one was an octagonal table that you painted some words on top in a stencil, and I copied that, and it turned out fabulous. Oh, that was a while ago. That was, yeah, it was. a Chalky Finish yes. product when Chalky Finish first came out and some of their French-inspired stencils. I loved that collection from Deco Art, and they still make it, and it's still a terrific product. It is. And the project's not that hard to do. And it turns out, I mean, amazing. I couldn't believe how beautiful it all looked. And I owe all that inspiration to Mark. <laughs> but when you're doing your projects, I mean, I suppose that's one of the things you keep in mind is just how complicated things will be for people. Well, I try to mix it up because uh -huh. I think there are a lot of lots and lots of very simple projects out there for people to do. And Every once in a while, I like to throw in a zinger, something that really challenges someone and sort of hopefully inspires them to go out and buy a jigsaw, maybe, <laughs> or a set of paints that they might no not normally use, or a roller or a different type of paintbrush, or maybe a band, I don't know, yeah. you know, a power tool. Because as fun as it is to, say, dye an Easter egg or 
paint a paint a pasta jar or put some fairy lights in a mason jar. I think that we've seen enough of those that we kind of grasp it. And I think it's for me, I like to kick it up to the next level sometimes and really challenge people and say, hey, why don't we use a scroll saw today and do something really interesting? And hopefully it'll pique somebody's interest to try something new and expand their uh, creative boundaries, so to speak. Yeah, well, giving people a new way to create or, or something they hadn't thought of before. I think that's pretty important. And that's one of the things about people like you who are, are inspiring us. I mean, we, you push us to do some interesting stuff <laughs> and make our homes and our surroundings and even clothes and accessories a lot more fun. And speaking of clothes, isn't that sort of how you got started in things to do with art and design? I did. You know, ever since I was very young, I was always interested in fashion. And I made the decision when I was about 13 that I was going to move to New York and become a famous fashion designer. That was it. I just decided that's what I was going to do. And from that day on, every single thing that I did was to focus on that particular goal. And that's what I did. I moved to New York. I worked for Oscar de la Renta. I finished college there. I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology While I was finishing school, I was interning at Oscar de la Renta and then working for him. And then I jumped off and started my own collection, opened my boutiques, started wholesaling my collection around the world and showing my collection around the world and did that for a very, very long time until I thought it was time to move on to something different. Did moving on to something different were... After doing this fashion thing, is that something you had to study at? Did somebody offer you a job? And that was, you said, aha, how did you get kind of moving to a different direction? It's interesting. Uh huh. I was a fashion designer pretty solidly for about 17, 18 years, showing my collections during New York Fashion Week, all that stuff. Uh huh. And I had made a lot of friends in the magazine industry. One, particular friend of mine. Her name was Atusa Rubenstein, and she had worked for Cosmo Girl magazine and approached me with her new idea, which was a magazine called Cosmo Girl. And she said, I'd like for you to, I know you're very busy, but I'd love for you to do a monthly article for Cosmo Girl magazine called Pool Room. And that's when I started doing a lot of DIY projects geared basically toward teen girls for this magazine. And from that article, I started writing books. I turned the first two years of those articles into my first book, which was called Super Sweet, The Ultimate Bedroom Makeover Guide for Teen Girls. And then from just from having that book, TV producer, as would have it, saw it in someone's dentist's office, (laughs) in a dentist's office, and called me and said, hey, we'd like you to audition for this show called While You Were Out are you interested? And I thought, yeah, it's a new experience. Let's go do this. I probably won't get it, but hey, it should be fun. And I got it. And Mm -hmm. that's when my career sort of switched from fashion to interiors. Ah, that's wonderful. (laughs) It's an interesting progression, but I mean, it all has to do with art and creativity and building on. Now, how long were you doing that show? While you were out, I did for four years. And while I was on that show, I guest appeared on Trading Spaces quite a bit. Uh And then I took a year to do another show called 10 Years Younger, which was a fashion makeover show also for TLC. And that's what brought me out to Los Angeles because that show was filming out here solidly. So I had to move out here for a little while. I ended up buying a house and... After about five years of back and forth between New York and Los Angeles, I said, you know what? I'm tired of the New York winters. I think I'm just going to stay in Los Angeles full time. And so that's how I ended up here. Well, that's awesome because you're right. The weather is tremendously better. Coming from Canada, (laughs) there's no way I'm moving back north. I like to drive to the snow, Mark. (laughs) Yeah, I'd like to be able to leave it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, being cold is not my thing. Yeah. And as far as the getting into, well, obviously, you know, with social media, that's probably part of the thing of of marketing. It just was that sort of a natural transition to kind of move into doing some of the YouTube videos and Facebook Live kinds of things or? 
I think it really is the only way to promote what it is that we do now creatively mm-hmm. is the internet and finding creative ways to reach as many people as we can with our content. So along with, you know, learning how to paint a new table in Moroccan style, for example, I also have to learn the new YouTube algorithms and, you know, how to boost a post on Facebook and how to coordinate a Facebook Live event. And it's been interesting. If I had my druthers, I would not be on the internet at all. But unfortunately, it is a crucial part of what we do as creative people. It's how people communicate now. I think that's very true. And I guess because it involves a lot of technology and constantly learning the new things, it it does take up a lot of time. (laughs) when sometimes you would like to be just thinking up creative ideas, I'm sure. It takes up all the time. Yeah. and But you do a great job of that, and you have a fun assistant, too, so <laughs> that must be more fun to she do. She makes things. my life so much easier, I have to tell you, Karen. She uh-huh. really does make the day go by in the best way. Yeah, I like the interaction that I see there. So that's great. Well, I've seen you at Craft and Hobby Association. And of course, you've promoted your books and you promote these products. And I think, you know, do you do a lot of live events? I don't do a lot of live events. I find things like CHA, as interesting as they are, it's a great place to go meet people and meet new manufacturers and see new products that are coming out, but I find them exhausting. <laughs> well, that's and true. so much so that I'm all the worse for wear for an entire week when I get back home. And uh, yeah, so live events are really, really tough for me. Yeah, I suppose, especially since you're a celebrity, so you're going to have lots of attention and lots of demands put on you at places like that. It's fun, but exhausting. Yeah. And I was thinking of something and then, oh, I knew what I wanted to say as we mentioned CHA, and I guess we should let people know because they have a new name. It's the Association for Creative Industries, so AFCI. It's going to be so hard to learn that new, and and, and what is it when you have, oh, I'm having a blank on what you call things when you abbreviate them. But anyways... (laughs) It's too early. I need another cup of coffee. (laughs) Everybody always needs another cup of coffee. (laughs) Oh, I live for that stuff. Yeah, it really wakes me up. (laughs) So it's an acronym. Acronym. That's it. I think you're right. I'm pretty positive you're correct about that. I don't know. Just one of those brain um, spasms or something. (laughs) It happens. (laughs) It happens. And now, As far as you do the crafts and things, do you do much in the way of things like fine art? I don't. I've been trying to paint a little bit more lately because I I sort of figured one day when I retire that I'm just going to sit in the backyard in a big flower caftan and just paint all day (laughs) and all night and, you know, drink cups of coffee and wear big jewelry and... (laughs) dye my hair pink. I don't know. But but I fantasize about that a lot. (laughs) Now, I found retirement just created a new career for me. But, you know, one moves on sometimes and finds different things to do. But yeah, well, I just wondered with all this crafting and painting and things, if it inspired you to, you know, turn out canvases or sculptures or things like that. As far as the day-to-day and doing crafts, was that something that you found as a kid you did too? Or were you more into just like drawing fashion? Or how did you really get, you know, when you were younger, you said you were pursuing everything towards it. And I'm sure you ended up in the Fashion Institute to study for a college. But through your younger years, were there any things in particular that you studied or did that you think were big influences, people in your family, anything like that? Well, yeah, I mean, I was always sort of doodling in the corner of my math notebook trying to figure out what project I was going to work on that night or that weekend. And I was constantly making things. I have uncles who were carpenters. My grandfather was a carpenter. My dad was a mechanic who owned a car lot and had an upholstery business on the side. So I had plenty of vinyl scraps to play with. My grandmother sewed. My mom painted. So there was plenty for me to do creatively and plenty of inspiration. And when I was about 12, A lot of people might know this about me. I post about it every once in a while. I joined a group called the Kashari Indian Dancers, which is a group started by a man named Buck Brashears. 
and it's based out of a kiva in my hometown. And we would learn traditional Sioux, Kiowa, and Navajo songs, costume, and dances. And we would perform those dances twice a year in the winter and summer ceremonials around the United States. We would travel. So when I was 12, I started learning more, even before that, a little bit beading and how to work with leather and how to cut, you know, seashells on a bandsaw and make abalone pieces for my costumes and work, you know, make feather bustles and loincloths, headdresses, all that stuff. So it was, you know, everything that I do now was all in the making as a kid. Yeah, I was thinking that's a wonderful thing, you know, for your young adolescence to get that kind of grounding that would give you your career. That's pretty awesome. It must have been really fun to do. Well, it's one of those things when you when you don't believe in fate, just kind of uh, take a look back and take stock of where your life has led you. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, just even the performance aspect, so which leads you to, you know, your career in television and in doing your presentations on on the Internet. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> You're right about fate. That's a very interesting thing there. So as far as we've gotten into some of the things that went into your background. Now, when you study, I think, you know, some people have referred to their educations in college, but I think there's a number of listeners who probably don't really understand what one learns in at the Fashion Institute or in college. Is that something, you know, what kind of studies did you pursue there that helped you in your career or that were requirements that helped develop this fashion career for you? Well, before I went to the Fashion Institute, I attended Colorado State University and got a bachelor's in business and marketing, then transferred to FIT and studied fashion design and costume history. So I always thought, you know, at some point, whether if I didn't become a fashion designer, I had a business degree to fall back on. And the business of fashion was always, I thought, very interesting. And it, it helped me a lot in my career as a fashion designer. And costume history was just one of the graduate programs they had that was the most interesting to me. So it gave me a real appreciation for how we dress the way we dress today, things that we still wear today that we've been wearing for 200 years. Fashion is like art. It's rooted in so many things, not just necessity, but trends and trends that have started 200 years ago, even longer sometimes. And I find that completely fascinating. Yeah, I think history and the history of fashion is, I mean, I, I just love history in general, but I think you're right that there's so many things that we think are new trends, but probably have their roots in very old origins. And I can also see because, you know, costume, of course, you were doing costumes, like you said, in your early teen years. So that was a natural transition. And I also think sometimes maybe it would be good if we all had to do a junior college course in business <laughs> just to help. I think you're right. One of the people I recently interviewed was a woman who helps people with their finances and especially women who are older and probably weren't raised in ways to, you know, they always turned it over to the man in the family to do that. And I think maybe we all need some good sound business understanding. <laughs> Absolutely. Business first, creativity second. Yeah. If you have a, if you have a, a creative business. And also just for a consumer to really understand what's going on. Sometimes it's helpful to make wiser choices, perhaps. <laughs> Being smart with your money is the only way that you can, I feel that you can, can be successful in a creative industry. It can be iffy. It's a lot of freelance work. You have to make your money work for you. You have to stretch it out sometimes when you have a dry spell. If you're freelancing, you may not get hired for a while. And if you're good with your money, you'll be fine. That's very true because it is a creative approach and you are a creative person. But on a personal and general level, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what creativity means to you. Wow. Well, that is a really <laughs> big question. It is. It? <laughs> it is the, the biggest question. <laughs> It means everything to me. I like many creative people, probably all creative people that I know suffer from a little bit of depression or anxiety. 
I think it just is par for the course of being a creative person that you are, you have these moods and that you have these, you know, bouts of, of anxiety and bouts of depression. Creativity is the only thing that has sort of kept me sane my entire life. It is the one thing that I can escape to that helps me feel better and feel like, feel like a normal person, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, as a physician, I look at it as process of creativity and the, the things that we do as we get our mind into that as being a very healing process and helps us. I think Jean Chinoda Bolin, who's a writer and a psychoanalyst that I admire a great deal, has written these books like Gods in Every Man, Goddesses in Every Woman. And there's that goddess of the hearth, Hestia. And and uh, I don't know, I guess it would be Hephaphatus. Is, is that how you... <laughs> Here I'm having problems with words today, but I think that the god of the forge or something, but but those are the, the kind of spirits to help us center ourselves and, and uh, that creative and more inner kind of, uh, or outward manifestation of our inner world or something. I think that would be one way of putting it, but it just helps us heal and uh, helps us. Up. So creativity, I agree with you. That's a great point about it making us feel better. And, you know, one of the things we've been talking about all the things you do, and normally I like to reference that a couple of times in an episode, and I haven't even talked about where people can find you. So maybe we should go into that because <laughs> we, well, we're talking about you and we want people <laughs> to find you. <laughs> you know, that you can't swing a cat without hitting one of my posts. <laughs> so you can find me on my blog, which is www.markmontano.com. You can also find me on YouTube if you just put Mark Montano in the search. And of course, on Facebook, Mark Montano on Facebook, just put in the name. If you can't remember that, make your mark. You can always put that in and I will pop up. Well, that's very useful things. We'll put those all in the show notes so that people really can find you with just a click since you are all over the internet. And then the books, there's a lot of those, especially I think the Big Ass Book of Crafts and the Big Ass Books, which is an interesting title. Maybe we should get into how you got that title going. <laughs> <But> <laughs> <laughs> those could be found on places like Amazon or Barnes & Noble, I suppose. Yep. You can find those books pretty much everywhere. I usually uh -huh. push people to Amazon because they can see the entire list of books if they just put Mark Montano in the search. That's great. And then, so that leads me to just how did you come up with the name for those books? I mean, they are big. <laughs> it, was a, it was a frustrated exclamation in a meeting I was having with an editor at the time. And she said, you know, we want to publish this book. And I had pitched an idea, but I didn't have a title. It was just going to be, I said, I wanted to do a craft book with at least a hundred projects in it. And she said, well, well, what would you call that? And I said, I have no idea. It's just a big ass book of crafts. And she <laughs> said, okay, well, well, why don't we call it the big ass book of crafts then? <laughs> and I said, okay, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Well, I was a little apprehensive after I went home and had agreed to it, uh -huh. but later it is that title that sort of catapulted that book into, well, now it's 29th printing. So Wow, that's pretty awesome. It's an awesome book too, but I mean, it does catch one's attention. <laughs> so it was a moment of frustration. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> well, <laughs> great, great things can come out of all kinds of places, including frustration. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So I certainly hope that people will take a chance to take a look at this book because, yeah, 29 printings, obviously, it's been very successful and that's a great thing. So are there more books coming up from Mark Montano in the future here? Or are you? I do have one book, but it's not a craft book. Oh. Ah. So I guess over this career, um, I've always worked for myself and I've almost always worked from home using home as my base. So I recently wrote a book called Get Off Your Ass, The Ultimate Guide to Working from Home. And this is a guidebook about how to organize your life and stay on task and also accomplish everything you need to 
while working from home. And I think that more and more people are telecommuting. They're working from home. Their companies are let, letting them work from home a few days a week. And people don't exactly and people don't know exactly how to do that and be successful at it. It's not as easy as it looks. You know, when no one's looking over your shoulder and you don't have to be at work at a certain time, maybe with coworkers or your boss in the next cubicle or down the hall, you tend to get a little, I don't know, what's the word? Lazy. Or distracted. I mean, there, you know, you talk about all the information that comes into us on the internet, and that's how you have to communicate with people. But there's so many distractions that can pull you off down little rabbit holes. And there you go. And, you know, there's an hour later, you're looking up and I haven't written that article. (laughs) Exactly. And the internet, by the way, is the number one distraction for people who are working from home. So just for some of the things that we talk about in the book that For example, if you jump on your Facebook page or look at Twitter, it can take you 15 to 30 minutes to get back on task. So the internet is the number one distraction when you work from home. So I talk a lot about you need to shut off your social media and focus on your to-do list and that's it. Yeah. Now your book, is that available right now? It will be available soon. I just got the final edited draft. We're finalizing the cover. It's taking a couple months longer than I thought it would to come out, but it'll be out very soon. Oh, good, because I'm going to get a copy. (laughs) And I'm going to send you one. Sounds like something I could really use. (laughs) Because there are all those distractions. But, you know, there is that sort of satisfaction of being able to go up and get your own special cup of coffee out of your own special mug. (laughs) Absolutely. Can you tell I have an obsession with coffee, Mark? (laughs) I can, and as, as do I. In fact, I tweeted yesterday, I'm making love to my afternoon cup of coffee And it's not something anyone should witness. (laughs) But I can relate. (laughs) It's just a private moment between (laughs) me and my inanimate objects. (laughs) Yes, and that lovely aroma and taste, and then that energizing feeling we have after we drink it. (laughs) It's all wonderful. Well, I think that's really exciting. So any other projects on the horizon besides the book or nothing you could talk about it? That's it for now. We have a lot, nothing I can really talk about, Uh but we do have some really terrific projects launching in the next couple of months. Lots of furniture pieces and some fashion related pieces. Every once in a while, I like to dive into the fashion part of my career and and show someone a DIY, uh, maybe a jacket makeover or something fun to do with their jeans. So we're doing a lot of that. It's going to be a fun, creative summer. So if you follow me, um, you know, you get to learn lots of new things. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'll be looking forward to that. Yes, I've been diving into resuscitating my wardrobe. And I have a fashion consultant who helped me do some things. And we pulled something out. And she said, it's like 30 years old. <laughs> she said, oh, you can keep that, but you have to change the buttons. <laughs> So I always like those cool thing ideas that you can just resuscitate something that you've had for a long time or kind of find your way to get one of the latest fashion looks. So with your background in fashion, since I'm following you, I'm going to be looking forward to that enormously. It should be fun. Sounds like great ideas, Mark. We have a lot coming down the pike. This is wonderful. And I am really looking forward to that book. So once again, people can just put Make Your Mark or Mark Montano into their search engine to be able to find you on the internet where you're everywhere, (laughs) which is great. (laughs) And probably some old reruns of some of the TV shows, I'm sure, show up now and then. Every once in a while. Every once in a while, which is cool because I really, really like the work you did there. And, well, I like all your work. (laughs) It's always fun to see you. So any final thoughts here about creativity and creativity in the world at large and people in general? Well, I guess I maybe just want to end with one thing. A lot of people are write to me and they say, you know, I can't do this. I love watching your stuff. I love, I love watching your videos. I love the projects that you make, but I just am not a creative person. And I always say to them, like, can you tie your shoe? And they're like, yes, dumb question. I'm like, well, then you just made a bow. And that is creativity. (laughs) 
Yeah. You know, do you wear makeup? Yes. Well, if you paint your eyeshadow on on your lipstick or, you, you know, put your lipstick on, that's painting. Right. That's a color palette. That is creativity. And I don't think people realize that they're being creative every day in small ways that just sort of help them get through the day. And if you can parlay that into something else, then they'll find their creativity, which is something that everyone has. That's really awesome. I mean, yeah, look at the normal tasks we do that are creative. And that's a springboard to making more things, which then makes you a very creative person. Really cool. I love that insight, Mark. That's awesome. Well, I have really enjoyed talking with you today. I did too. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's not no problem. I mean, you're very welcome. I am just thrilled. So I hope everyone who is not familiar with Mark at this point will soon learn about him and check things out. And to all of your fans, <laughs> who I'm hoping that they've enjoyed this conversation with you as much as I have. And so we'll say goodbye for this episode. And thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to a Creative Approach podcast today. I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher if you've not already done so. Please check the podcast out on the Facebook page where I keep you up to date on our latest episodes. I'd love to have you become a member of the Creative Approach podcast Facebook group where you can share your thoughts and find additional news posted. Check out the website www.acreativeapproachpodcast.com My team and I are working on developing a great home for fans of the show. On the site, you'll find a Patreon page tab to those who want to offer financial support to the podcast. I look forward to sharing a conversation with another exciting guest on the next episode and send all my listeners best wishes in your creative approach to life. Thank you, listeners, for being with us at the podcast today. Please visit our webpage at www.acreativeapproachpodcast.com, where you will find show notes for this and other episodes and our social media links. I hope you will join us in future conversations as we explore a creative approach.